Welcome back to the Peace Offering Podcast. Today's interview is with Mike Fave. Mike's an independent health researcher and a nurse practitioner. Mike's been working in the bioenergetic space for a number of years, and I first learned about him with uh, with the Energy Balance Podcast that he co-hosts with Jay Feldman. Recently, Mike has uh, launched a YouTube channel with a plethora of amazing videos and great content. So I encourage you to check that out. And his website is mikefave.com. On there, you can get a free nutritional blueprint, which helps you figure out your basal metabolic rate, calculate your macronutrient content of the foods that you should be eating. Uh, and it's really helpful for helping dial all that in. In today's conversation, we talk about this, this, this uh, macronutrient breakdown, the, the challenges that different dietary systems have, how to move someone into the bioenergetic space without creating a whole bunch of problems like weight gain, and also how to improve hormonal profiles for people. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for joining us. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Yeah, we were we were just talking offline about context and and how important that is, and um, that that is what I see as sort of the clinician's art form is discerning someone's context, uh, how you do that, and then finding an appropriate um, not just not just sort of outcome for them, but the, the sequencing of how you would get them from where they are to where they want to be. That's not easy to do. It's much easier mm -hmm. to, it's much easier to espouse what the outcome should be and be it kind of abstract the whole process and talk about micro or macronutrients and the ideals and everything. But even if those are true, getting someone to that point is the hard part. That's the important part, we'll say. And and that requires a much broader understanding of how things work because now you have to understand different contexts. Uh, for example, you know, if someone is having health problems because they're vegan and you need to, you, you have somewhat of a context there, but there are other lifestyle components and, yep. and you can make some assumptions like, okay, if they, they are probably lacking in fat soluble vitamins that would be in animals. So that could be a big bottleneck for them, uh, as well as some other things, but someone could also be coming from sort of a low carb sphere and they're going to have their own set of issues and obstacles versus somebody coming from maybe a low calorie sphere, intermittent fasting, fasting, uh, or someone who, who would tried all that and went to carnivore and now they're not, they don't have any, any inputs from plant, <laughs> the plant kingdom at all. Um, and so maybe you can, maybe you can start us where, with your sort of assessment process, because one of the things that you're excellent at, uh, is, is clinically with coaching people. So um, how do you assess context for people? And, and what kind of assumptions can you make without even hearing, like maybe without even hearing their symptoms? Yeah, that's a great question, Jonathan. So the, the first thing when I work with somebody is I try to get a sense of what they're doing over their, their whole lifestyle. So I, I will spend the discovery call I do with people, a lot of people are surprised by this, but it is about an hour long. So I, and that's free. So I'll be talking to them for an hour for free. So I can see, can I help this person or not? Right. Do I have the skill set and ability to help this person? And also I'm gauging, you know, this person's getting to learn about what I'm doing, but I'm also trying to understand, you know, what do they have specifically going on? And so that I'm asking questions, you know, what is, you know, what are you doing dietarily? What is your dietary history? What is your, what is your sleep cycle? Like, what is your stress levels? Like what's going on in relationships? What's going on with your supplementation? And then also what are your major symptom profiles? So I'm looking at all of these things. And then I also have people put in information in chronometers so I can see what they're doing on a regular basis. And then I'll, you know, I actually will, a lot of times for people, I won't necessarily have them go and do labs right away because a lot of times people have glaring problems in their foundation. And so if somebody comes to me and they're having, let, let's say for an example, they're having digestive issues 
and they're coming from a vegan diet where their diet is, you know, it's nuts, it's legumes, it's grains. I don't need to do $10,000 worth of testing to switch the food sources that they're having so that they have a little bit, uh, a little bit easier time digesting these different foods and then see where the chips fall, see what happens. Okay. Are your, have your digestive symptoms eliminated? Have you minimized this, the bloating, the gas, the constipation, the diarrhea, et cetera, when we switch out foods high in some of these problematic fermentable fibers or some of the irritating proteins, lectins, whatever, whatever else, anti-nutrients, whatever you want to call them inside these foods. And so for me, I start to work, I get a full perspective on where they're at in multiple areas of their lifestyle. And I start to work from the lowest hanging fruit, most basic stuff first. So that's what's going on. That's sleep. That's dietary adjustments. That's exercise. That's stress levels. That's relationship components. All of these elements, because a lot of times people are having problems because of this, not because of vitamin A is super toxic and you're overloaded on vitamin A or iron is super toxic and you're out overloaded on iron, or you just haven't had enough DHA and sat in the sun for long enough or things like this. Like a lot of people's underlying issues are foundational components in their lifestyle. And so I think from my perspective, it's correct that first, and then we can get to specifics. Then if you're coming from carnivore and we see that, you know, you've been eating steak three times a day for two years now, and then we, we can assume, okay, well, you're, you have some, probably have some iron overload. So we look at labs and now, yes, you have some iron overload coming from, from carnivore. You have a bit of elevated liver enzymes, you know, you have some digestive stuff going on. The gut profile is an ideal. It's like those things. Then we start to correct. We can correct those things, you know, but the baseline stuff was take somebody coming from carnivore is like, let's start getting carbs back on board. Let's start bringing in some of these different plant foods. Cause they're not all toxic. And then we, and then we'll go from there. We'll get to the iron overload and all these other pieces because this foundation has to be right first. And most times that is, that is off. Are there some, so, so getting to the various diet uh, ideologies, okay, so if we were to say, it, and so we're talking about people who are trying their best to make an improvement, not someone who's oblivious to uh, the the negativity of a standard American diet, okay, so is there, you know, yes. someone's like beyond that point, right, yeah. they are they're trying to be vegan or they making that a choice for health, we'll call it, not for ethical reasons or w w some other psychological reason. Um, there is a, or they're carnivore or they're low carb or they're calorie restricting or they're, so can you make a set of assumptions about energy bottlenecks on these different dietary systems? It's not even just energy, but yeah, that's, it's not even just energy bottlenecks. There's problems with each of those. And the other thing I want to point out before we get to this is that there will be a spectrum of response to different diets. So the, the standard American diet is probably hands down one of the worst. So when somebody moves to keto, carnivore, paleo, plant-based, whatever the thing is, they will usually, especially if it's set up appropriately feel better hands down because the standard American diet and the processed food culture is so terrible that when you move to something like one of these diets, even though they individually have problems, it's still better than this, <laughs> than what people are already doing. Right. You start to worry about your food quality. You start to worry about your microbiome. You start to think about nutrients. You start to talk about macronutrients. You start to understand caloric intake. Right. So people will go through this progression and then what winds up happening is they think I'm getting better on this diet. So then it must be good. Right. And it's, you are getting better on this diet, but it doesn't mean that now you're at optimal just because you're better than what the standard American diet was. If you're better than the standard American diet, like that's is one step further, but there's multiple factors to consider when you get to this point. Now to your specific question with each of these diets, you can't, there are a set of problems that you run into with them, right? So for each one, there's a different set of problems. When you're on, when people are on a more plant-based, vegan, vegetarian type of diet, there's certain nutrient deficiencies that they tend to run into, uh, a lot of ma macro and micronutrient deficiencies. And then there's also digestive issues related to these diet because of the foods that are being chosen most times. 
So some of the nutrient deficiencies you can see with these diets, especially if they're not constructed appropriately, are huge issues with protein intake, huge issues with fat-soluble vitamins, issues with some of the B vitamins, and then issues with some of the minerals, depending on how that diet is set up. And so you, you will fix some things, but some things will then invariably get worse over time. And that's when people start to transition. Another, for another example, be carnivore diet. Now, carnivore diet, you have other nutrient problems. You have things like potassium. You have things like vitamin C. You have certain other B vitamins like folate, depending on how much organ meat and things you're taking in on a regular basis. Then you have concerns around iron overload. Then you have concerns around not having enough fiber and what that does into the microbiome. And you have concerns around stress hormones because you don't have carbohydrates available. And then, so each one of these diets creates, improves some things and creates problems in other areas. And so instead of adhere to the ideology, the question is, what do I need to be optimal? How do I get all of these? Because the thing that I think people miss is like, what is the goal? What is the primary outcome that you're shooting for? Are you trying to be a carnivore? Or are you trying to get optimal health? If you're trying to get optimal health, then we want to, we don't want to be married to the ideology of carnivore. We want to be understanding what are the specific elements that I need on a regular basis so I can function at my best and, and live the, the best possible life that I can. And so in that circumstance, it's like, okay, well, we want to have high quality animal foods. We want to make sure that we have, you know, the nutrient density, but we probably also want to have some fiber and some plant foods for microbiome regulation, things like this. And we probably also want to have carbohydrates so that we're not nuking the hormonal profile. And so it's, it's not that, you know, it, it, it's not about that carnivores are wrong or whatever the thing is. It's not about having a different ego identity attached to a camp. It's more about like, what are the principles I can take from all these areas and create something specific to me that I'm able to actually achieve these outcomes with. And that, that's what I'm doing with clients is I'm trying to figure out what do they specifically need based on their previous context to get them from point A to point B. I don't care about the dietary ideologies or what camp you're from or, or who you associate with or who you believe in. It's irrelevant to me because I see the target and then I see what do we need to get to the target and it's what are the steps we need to take there from a dietary lifestyle perspective and also shifting mindset and starting to understand and, and have a, con a context around these things. So let's use the case of like low carb or keto. Um, I know we're going to, we're going to have to make some assumptions here. Uh, so, so That's fine. if you, yeah. if you're willing to do that, <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. Be, um, what are some of the things that, what are some of the typical issues if someone said, okay, Mike, I'm with you. Like I I'm ready to start adding carbs back into my diet. What are some of the potential, uh, pitfalls or, or problems they may have? And how would you transition someone over? Because it's not as simple, um, as, okay, you were eating, you know, 50 grams of carb yesterday, and now you're going to eat 300 because that's twice the amount of protein that I should be eating. Right. Um, so, so what, what does that transition look like? Yeah. So this is actually a really great question. And this is, this is something that I think if it's not done right, a lot of people start to get into dietary no man's land where they're like, they tried adding carbs and they have a bad response, but then they go back to keto and they're still having these problems. <laughs> so there it's, it's, there's a way to do it appropriately. And interestingly enough, uh, Dr. Sean Baker was just talking about how he tried to add in carbohydrates in the form of apples at hundred grams of carbs to lower his cholesterol based on some of the lean mass hyper responder, uh, information. I'm actually going to make a video on this, but I guess we'll talk about it here as well. I, <laughs> the video is going to probably come out next week. Um, but essentially for somebody like Sean Baker, and, and I'm using this as an example, Using apples is probably the worst way to try to get carbohydrates in the diet if you are coming from a carnivore background. Why? Apples are very high in sorbitol. So sorbitol is a sugar alcohol. And if you want to get diarrhea, bloating, and gas, then eat, ap eat a bunch of raw apples. <laughs> but the other, and another problem is apples have an imbalanced glucose to fructose ratio. So what winds up happening is in our intestines, in order to absorb fructose, past a certain threshold, we need to have glucose present. They go hand in hand together across the intestinal lining. And so if you just have a bunch of fructose in excess of glucose, depending on the person, you will just leave that fructose in the intestine with the sorbitol. 
And now what winds up happening, especially if you're a carnivore and you haven't had any plant foods or you've been uh, high fat keto and you're not really having much fibers, you probably already have a dysbiotic microbiome. And now you just sent in free sugars to have for them to have a field day. And then you're going to probably have digestive issues pretty quick. So the, the problem in, with it, the other thing, another component, and this is a, li a little bit tangential, and I do want to be specific to your question, but with the lean mass hyper responders element and the uh, like lowering cholesterol by bringing adequate carbs in, when you have somebody who's 260 pounds with a large amount of muscle mass, 100 grams of carbs is a drop in the bucket. So if he wanted to replete his carbohydrate status and nutrient status, and to be fair, he does talk about this, his carb intake would have to be significantly higher, especially because he's training. And so you, this is, that's where his, that's his context becomes very important. You have somebody who's on carnivore. You have somebody who trains excessively, or maybe not excessively, but in large amounts, lifts heavy amounts of weights, does like pretty crazy things in terms of physical activity. And you also have somebody who's significantly larger than the average person with a very high muscle mass. So in this circumstance, his experiment was set up poorly for him to actually get the result that he wanted. And so this is the same thing that occurs when people are wanting to transition from these lower carbohydrate, lower calorie fasting, keto carnivore diets if they want to get a particular outcome, they need to set things up appropriately. And so the way to set those things up is number one, you want to be making sure you want to know how much energy do you need, right? Because people don't want to come, people lose 100, 150 pounds doing this low carb stuff, which it does happen. There's no lie about that. <laughs> I'm, there's no denying that. Doesn't You don't have to go low carb to do that, but this, but people do indeed get results with this. And so there's no denial on my end around that. So the thing is people don't want to gain that weight back. They don't want to come to bioenergetic and slam ice cream all day long and be back where they started before they were keto. So you need to figure out what's your total caloric intake requirement. So how many calories you need in a day, just a ballpark. The next step after that is now you can figure out your macros because the macros will fit within that caloric target. So you want to make sure how much you want to next determine how much protein do I need? Because protein is going to be your structural macronutrient. It's going to provide for lean mass, your skin, your hair, your nails, your, your muscles, your bones, your organs, et cetera. It's going to be the structural component. It's going to provide for amino acids, uh, for uh, neurotransmitters, for hormones, for enzymes, all this type of stuff. So it's absolutely essential that you have adequate protein for the, in, in the diet. Then from there, you have two fuel sources. And this is where all this debate is about between these diets, right? Which fuel source am I going to use? Am I using diesel or am I using gasoline? Am I using carbs or am I using fat? And so in the, the bioenergetic sphere, and it, from my perspective, carbohydrates are a much better fuel source because of their effects on the hormonal profile, because of their effects inside the mitochondria and adjusting reactive oxygen species production, and then also in terms of lowering stress. So we want to prioritize carbohydrates, so carbs are going to be the main energy source. Now, does this mean you now go on a low-fat diet? No. <laughs> if you go on a low-fat diet, which I did when I was transitioning from the low carb to higher carb intake. I went to like 20 grams of fat a day or 30 grams of fat a day and like 800 grams of carbs. You will then run into other problems with satiety, with blood sugar, with digestion. Uh, the fats are helpful for slowing gastric emptying so that the food drips into the small intestine and you're able to absorb it better. They release bile acids and trigger cholecystokinin, which aids in the digestive process. And then they also help to blunt the blood sugar rise in the curve so that you're not coming up and coming down if you're just drinking orange juice all day long. So you want to then figure out how much fat do I need so that I'm providing for these things. Also, they're important for hormonal function. I have young guys that I work with in their 20s. They're on a low-fat diet, and they have ED, and they don't get morning wood and all this type of stuff. Or women, they'll lose their cycles, or they won't be able to have be lubricated during intercourse or things like this. Fats are essential for steroid hormone production. So you want to have adequate fats. So the question is not which, which one do I use? It's how much of each do I need for my particular outcome? And so from there, when you're coming from this low carb diet and you're coming from the keto and low calorie diet, you, what you want to uh, the low calorie intermittent fasting, that type of perspective, I kind of link them all together because they tend to trend together, even though there's specific differences. So excuse me for not being super nuanced here, but, uh, it just for ease of conversation, what winds up happening is you want to slowly lower your fat intake to an appropriate threshold. I usually shoot between 20 and 30% of calories, but while you're transitioning down, that's 20 to 30% of calories of fat. While you're transitioning down, you may be higher than that 
so that you can slowly stepwise yourself down from using primarily fats to now using carbs. And you slowly bring your carbohydrate intake up and then you're adjusting it based on what your caloric needs are. So you have this overarching caloric target and then you're tweaking the fat down and bringing the carbs up within that caloric target and keeping protein stable. So that's really the way that people have to transition up. And then the other thing is the foods that you choose here become extremely important because again, you don't want to try to get 300 grams of carbs a day from apples. You're going to have a bad time. I have a bad time with it too. I've been eating high carb for almost a decade and I still cannot eat raw apples in large quantities. I'll get gas and bloating and diarrhea, et cetera. So you want to probably shoot for carb sources that have a one-to-one glucose to fructose ratio that don't have high FODMAP content that you I cannot tell, like, for example, for you, Jonathan, I couldn't say, hey, Jonathan, you're going to just do well with this, this food source. I don't know how your body is going to interact. I can give you a variety of different options for you to try and help explain why you may have a negative problem with something, but I cannot sit here and pretend to know how every individual will react to every different component. There is a lot of inter-individuality with these things, and that is also not talked about in these diet spheres. And when you start working with hundreds of clients, you start and you start you start to see oh i've had a client who had hereditary fructose intolerance <laughs> we're not putting fruit juice on that diet zero chance that fruit juice is going in it was rice it was potatoes it was yams it was oats those were the carb sources in that context the person did fine with that and then i have other people who don't do well with starches i have people i work with autoimmune disease ra ankylosing spondylitis you put starches on board their symptoms get worse so in those circumstances they're shifted more towards fruit juices they're shifted more towards whole fruits and things like this and that's where the contextual pieces become extremely important and the way to determine this is personal experimentation and awareness of self without direct outsourcing to somebody else to directly tell you what to do having somebody guide you is fine but at the same time it's important that you are taking your own feedback and experience into consideration in this process or else you will continually be lost because, you know, whether it's me, whether it's Jay, whether it's Ray Pete, whether it's Morley Robbins, whether Jack Cruz, whoever these, whoever the people are, they are probably going to be unable to tell you exactly how you will respond to all these different components. They are just providing guidance, framework, information, et cetera. Okay. Um, so in that transition where you're slowly lowering fat and slowly increasing carbs, um, what are the metrics that you use to determine the velocity of that change? Are you, are, are so are you having people step on a scale? Are you having them look at body fat percentage or weight or test, um, or test some blood metric? What, what are they doing? Yeah. So that's actually another really great question. <laughs> um, it depends on what their goals are. Uh, most people, when you add carbs in from a low carbohydrate diet are going to gain five to 10 pounds, depending on your body mass and water weight and glycogen. So every gram of glycogen you store comes with another three grams of water. So if you've been depleted on a low carb diet, you're going to get some glycogen back. It's not body fat. It will come back within a week or two weeks. It's pretty normal. Um, from that point thereafter, if you continue to upwardly gain weight, it is probably not glycogen and water weight anymore. You know, the, if you're going 20 pounds up, that's not all water weight and glycogen. So you need to be careful what you rationalize as, as like these different things. You want to be very honest with yourself around what's going on. And it's not to say that X, Y, Z thing isn't working. It's more to say that X, Y, Z thing needs a little bit more tweaking for your specific context. And this is why understanding and the, and I'm going to get into the specifics, understanding how you feel. And what your symptom profile is in the moment is absolutely essential and key. And so the metrics that I am gauging with people in general, there's the individual context. I'm working with a type two diabetic. We'll look at sugars. We'll look at lab values. Fine. But I'm working with just a normal individual. They're not type two diabetic. They just want to transition. They don't want to gain weight. We'll look at weight. But other things to look at is what's going on with digestive function. What's going on with brain fog? What's going on with your ability to last between meals without blood sugar drops, hangriness, these types of things? How are you sleeping through the night? How is hormonal function? Libido, for, my, for guys that could be morning wood, for women that, that could be what's going on with the cycle, 
all of these different components and actually keep an eye on this real time information. Cause a lot of people are obsessed with these empirical values, right? I have a CGM. I have a, I'm doing this lumen. Now I'm checking my CO2 and my, my oxygen ratios to see if I'm burning carbs and I'm burning fats. That's all well and good. But at the end of the day, what people are really shooting for is how are they feeling and functioning? So people, you can have all these metrics and you can show, you know, I think Dave Asprey and Thomas Lauer are like, yeah, I'm 6% body fat. And it's like, when I was 6% body fat, I felt like garbage. <laughs> so that metric was irrelevant to what my ultimate outcome was. And I was not progressing in the gym and I was not sleeping at night. And I was having all types of mood issues and blood sugar problems and digestive issues. So it's important to look at the full picture of the symptom profile and understand what is, you know, the, or to understand that these symptoms are real time data on what's going on with your body. When you take a lab or you have a specific value, you have one snapshot in time. But when you start to get a sense of how you're feeling and you develop a degree of awareness around your own experience on a moment by moment or day by day or month by month, whatever that basis is, and start to get a sense of the change, then you can start to tweak in real time instead of get the labs and have to wait and then have to make the adjustment and then not change again until you get the labs again. Also, that's expensive to keep doing labs to see where you're at. You want to go based on this real time data um, and then make these adjustments. And what I'll have people track is I'll have them track their diet because a lot of times, and this is something that I see in the alternative health sphere, a lot of these alternative health practitioners, they'll sell you subs. <laughs> You'll get all the subs in the world that you want. There's hundreds and hundreds of subs. I have people with pages and pages of subs they're taking every day, just like these crazy regimens. And then they're still not feeling better because this foundational component of what you're putting in your mouth every day in terms of food has not been addressed. It's just, oh, go do Mediterranean diet. It's the best. Go do keto. That's the best. Instead of understanding that all the macronutrients and micronutrients coming from food and the specific elements of food are absolutely essential to adjust. And then you can start talking about subs. The subs are like sprinkles on the cake, unless there's some specific issue that you're trying to correct. And so it's correct the diet, look at what's going on there, be aware of your symptoms and what's going on, make adjustments from that perspective. And then you start getting to these other tiers again, foundation first, and then get into the specifics as you go along, unless there's a very obvious problem. Like the person is overtly hypothyroid. It's like, okay, well, we have to fix this. Yeah, gotcha. You made a comment um, before answering that question about um, the types of carbs people are introducing, whether they be uh, sort of simple sugars or starches, and they're that you're working with somebody who is has hereditary fructose intolerance. Um, I'm curious, are there other instances where people may not tolerate fructose? Um, so so I, I get the, the starches piece that has a lot to yes. do, I'm assuming with fiber and the disruption in endotoxin or microbiome disruptions that that could cause and the downstream effects of that. Is that, is that correct? Why in terms of people not, yeah, not being so able to handle starches? It's it, there's a couple of components. So if you have dysbiosis, as you were alluding to, then starches can become problematic, but if you have, um, if you have issues with blood glucose regulation, than simple sugars because the pure glucose that you get from the starches actually will spike blood glucose higher and then people will feel that more whereas if you have a piece of whole fruit you have glucose and fructose and fructose doesn't spike the blood sugar that high plus the polyphenols and fiber content of the fruits will actually help to keep things uh, under control so there's the blood glucose this uh, component and then there's the digestive component with starches that some people will have more issues with than, than the other. And it's, it's not only endotoxemia. There are some, some studies looking at tolerance to starches based on things like amylase gene copy and whatnot, finding people that have less copies of amylase have a harder time digesting starches and have worse metabolic outcomes with them. So there's, there's, there's different nuanced components with this stuff. But, and that's why it's important. You don't have to go do amylase gene copy testing. You don't, you just, the person <laughs> tries starches and they see how they feel. And then they, they adjust based on that. So it doesn't have to be this super precision medicine approach for everything. A lot of times you can just adjust on, on how they're feeling. Okay. But go ahead, go ahead. Well, the other half of that would be uh, adjusting for fructose intake. So I'm yes. curious what, what 
there other than having some issue with like hereditary fructose intolerance are there other issues with fructose handling that people may have yes 100 percent. and so there's a couple of problems that people can run into with fructose one certain people if they have an excess of fructose from some of the foods they'll have a problem and that's where it's talking about that one-to-one -one glucose to fructose ratio so some people even like five grams of extra fructose is a problem so in those circumstances, it's not that they have to avoid fructose, but they have to shoot for something that's one-to-one -one glucose to fructose, or this is a, this is a little sneaky trick that I was doing for some people that are having issues with different glucose to fructose ratios. I'll have them add rice or dextrose to some meal that has an excess of fructose. Like if they're doing too much honey or something, they're finding they're having a bad response. You can have, put the honey in some rice. And now you've balanced glucose to fructose ratio. And a lot of people will like the mix because salt and starch and sugar together <laughs> taste pretty good. Um, so things like that, but that's not ideal because now you don't really get the nutrient density from some of these things. You also want to be making sure your, your carb sources are providing you with some nutrients, which is why I personally tend to shoot for fruits, mainly tubers. And then, you know, fruits and tubers would be the primary, but then there's some other things like oats or rice or things that some people do well. And, and that's specific that that's specific. But in terms of other problems with fructose, if somebody has a fatty liver, right? If they have a really fatty liver, you probably don't want to slam tons of rapidly digesting fructose on that liver, nor do you want to slam high amounts of saturated fats on the liver. What usually works best is increased protein intake. And then the next step after that is you can have carbs from fruit and from starches, but you want to do whole fruit. You won't want to be slamming juice. So you don't want to be done doing tons of orange juice and pineapple juice, go to our whole fruit, frozen fruit, dried fruit, because you're basically slowing down the rate of absorption of the carbohydrates due to the food matrix from the fibers. So that the liver doesn't get slammed, kind of like, <laughs> like hitting nitrous on the engine when it's already having a hard time. So you want to slow that down a little bit. And then the other thing that you want to do is maybe use more of the, the glucose sources from starches at that point in time, like, so that you're able to actually, again, you're not slamming the liver and then the fructose with the liver can adjust some of the metabolism. So if you're in a dysfunctional state, it can possibly make things a little bit more difficult and saturated fats can as well. So in that circumstance, it doesn't mean corn oil becomes the, the major food source. It's more you probably want to shift towards things like avocado, macadamia nuts, olive oil until the liver clears out. Once the liver clears out, it doesn't take that long if things are set up appropriately. Then you can start to ramp up some of the other carb sources and play around with the fat sources and people will start to tolerate it quite well. It's just there. This is again, this is something that's important to understand. And I think that gets missed because it's it's a very it's like a very minor switch in perspective but that minor switch makes a huge difference. So the metabolic, the metabolic context of somebody who's normal, doesn't have any health issues is very different from the metabolic context of somebody who is diabetic and the metabolic context of somebody who has fatty liver. And then even from an athlete, an athlete, I've worked with athletes, I've worked with CrossFitters, all different types of athletes. They just need calories, even bodybuilders. They need calories they need food that they can digest that doesn't have a lot of fiber and bulk and components because their activity level is so high and the, digest, the digestive tract is actually limited to a large extent. So you want to make sure that you actually don't have so much fibers and things slowing down digestion when you need to plow through all this food because you don't feel terrible. But then on the flip side, if you have a diabetic or you have somebody with fatty liver or metabolic dysfunction... You want to make sure that the fuel sources that are going in aren't rapidly hitting the system because when you rapidly inject fuel into a system where the ability to use that fuel is not optimized, then you can start to run into some problems. And that's where you see the blood sugar shoot up and all this type of stuff. It doesn't mean it needs to be low carb though. It just means that the types of carbs you're using and how you're setting things up has to be done in a different way than somebody who would be normal or somebody who's an athlete. And th this is where those contextual pieces start to come and become important. And that's the same thing with nutrients. The nutrient requirements of a carnivore versus a vegan versus somebody like a standard American diet person is also going to be different in these different categories because they have different contexts they are coming from different areas and the corrections will need to be different, which is why this arguments around which diet is the best. It, it's just like it falls for me, it falls on flat ears because it's like it depends on what's going on with the person. So it's more, how do we distill the principles out and understand them in a different context instead of have like the 
carnivore cure or whatever the thing is. Right. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now is probably a good time to educate the listeners on this um, concept of the Randall cycle, which um, has been uh, defined ad nauseum within the bioenergetic community, but outside of it um, <laughs> is sort of a novel concept, even though it's uh, been identified for a long time. So can you talk about this and its importance? Sure. So the, the, it, the first thing I'll start off in saying is, if somebody really wants to understand the direct mechanisms of the Randall cycle, I have covered them at in depth on the Mike Babe Science YouTube channel. So they're, I'm not going to lie, it's extremely research heavy. And it's, I'm like going through tons of research studies to show the mechanisms of the Randall cycle and what's going on. But if you really want to see what's going on directly in the mitochondria and how this cycle works and what the ramifications are downstream, I have laid it out pretty pretty in depth. So there's two different videos covering the different sides of the Randall cycle. Now, the general gist of the Randall cycle is when you're oxidizing carbs, or you won't be able to oxidize fat in the mitochondria. And when you're oxidizing fat, you're not going to be able to oxidize carbs in the mitochondria. And so there's a switching of substrate, you're not going to oxidize both at the same time, you're going to you're going to adjust the substrates. And basically the oxidation of carbohydrates the things that when the changes that carbohydrates do inside the mitochondria inhibit the utilization of fats. But then as the carbohydrate influx starts to slow down, what winds up happening is the fat oxidation comes in and then the, the oxidation of fats inhibits the oxidation of carbs. The changes in the mitochondria uh, from oxidizing fats will block the utilization of carbs. So you're, you have a, there's a switch in the mitochondria between the two substrate. Now I know the, the initial reaction most times like, oh, then I can't eat carbs and fat together. The one thing to keep in mind is that the context we are talking about is that this is at an individual cellular level. And so if we think how many cells are in the body, I don't know, billions, trillion cells, whatever the thing is, all of these cells will be using different substrates simultaneously. So a, as an example, your heart cells will be using a different substrate while you're from your liver cells at the same time. So your heart could be using some fats and your liver could be using some carbs. So it doesn't mean that your meals have to be either or it just, it's important. This is more important to understand it, when you start to make gross changes in the diet where you're like drastically eliminating carbs. And when you're, when you drastically eliminate carbs, now you're forcing fat oxidation across the whole system, except for the central nervous system and certain organs. And the reason this is a problem in, in terms of oxidizing primarily fatty acids is because the change inside the mitochondria that occur with the oxidation of fatty acids is not ideal in, in the long run. And the problem is you start to get too much NADH in ratio to NAD plus you start to get an increased production of reactive oxygen species. You start to get an increased oxygen consumption and an uncoupling of the mitochondria. And the problem is, is this is uncoupling occurring with decreases in ATP production um, to help manage the reactive oxygen species stress and the over reduction of coenzyme Q inside the <laughs> electron transport chain. I know it's a little bit technical, but basically when you switch to fats versus carbs, fats start to slow things down and comparatively to carbs in terms of ATP production and, and whatnot. And I think the, the reason for this, and this is me hypothesizing on it is your body has an ample supply of fats. And so fats are always the backup fuel, no matter what, like if you run out of carbs, if you don't have carb sources in your environment, your body will start to prioritize fat oxidation over the whole system. And then that's that plus the lack of carbs sends a signal metabolically to take slow things down because you are technically in a famine esque state because you are liberating your fat and burning that for energy versus, you know, having carbs come in exogenously and switch to hormonal profile. I don't know if that, so there's a, there's it, when you're understanding the Randall cycle, you have this switching, it's happening at different circumstances and different parts of the body, right? And even in the same parts of the body, like you can have different cells in the heart oxidizing carbs with other cells oxidizing fat. So it's on a cell by cell basis, but then also the whole switch becomes important in the context of what's going on with stress and what's going on with the energy metabolism at that point in time 
because if you have this whole lack of carbs, you change the whole hormonal profile and you start oxidizing fats over the whole system. And there's problems with the oxidation of those fats versus the oxidation of those carbs uh, be, because of those specific mechanisms. And so it's basically, it's, it's, I think it's almost a switch for a stress response and a slowing down of the metabolic system cellularly and also from a hormonal profile. How relevant is that to determining your macro, your fat carb intake for your dietarily? How relevant is knowing the Randall cycle? Uh, it's relevant in the sense that you want to be prioritizing carbs as your main energy source over fats, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have only carbs in one meal or only fats in another meal. It just means that you you want to be having a higher carbohydrate intake relative to fats. And then this is what I was talking about before is it's not only about oxidizing if, or like what you're using as a fuel, because all of these components have different effects that aren't related to being a fuel source, right? So you have uh, the, we talked about protein being structural. We don't really want to oxidize protein or use it as a fuel. The target there is about 0.82 grams per pound, assuming you don't have any specific considerations like liver disease or kidney disease or something, or, or you're very obese, then the target would change. But the, so that's a structural component. We really don't want to use that as a fuel source. It doesn't make sense. You might as well use carbs or fats. But then when you start to get to carbs or fats, carbs, you want to be the primary fuel source, which is that's where the Randall cycle idea comes in. That's where it becomes more important. But then that doesn't mean you want to completely get rid of fats because the fats are important. As I said, digestion, blood sugar, hormonal profile, um, satiety, et cetera. So you need the fats on board and you need the carbs on board, but you're just, you, the Randall cycle is only important in saying that you want to have, it's not only important in that it comes important in disease processes, but in this context it becomes important to say that we want to be prioritizing carb oxidation over just fat oxidation. And then there's other factors again to consider. So you have, and, and I think this is a good perspective for multiple areas where when you're trying to construct a, like a diet, there's a strategy involved, right? So it's like almost a game of strategy. Um, it, it, it requires the strategic thinking around what you're doing. So you can address one element of, you can consider one point in your strategy, right? So I'm going to look at, you know, carb oxidation versus fat oxidation because Randall cycle. So that's one tenant that you can look at. Then you have, well, what are the specific effects of fats? So uh, that's the, the areas I mentioned, blood sugar, digestion, hormones. Okay. And then what are the specific effects of carbs in this other area? They help to provide for, for different signaling molecules throughout the body. They help to create the mucus lining inside the intestine. They're essential for central nervous system function, et cetera. So you start to add in these different, these different strategies and you're, you're using multiple strategies and multiple principles to construct a diet instead of just trying to find one singular one. And this is something different in the bioenergetic sphere than some of the other dietary spheres, because a lot of people focus on this PUFA stuff, the polyunsaturated fats. Those are a problem, 100%. But then there's endotoxin, then there's stress hormones, then there's micronutrients, then there's the different plant toxic compounds, which they talk about in carnivore that you want to avoid. But then there's, you know, um, then there's some of the polyphenolic compounds that are beneficial that they talk about in, in the plant-based spheres. So it's, we're stacking strategies. We're stacking principles to build the diet now. And we're taking multiple elements into consideration instead of just, you know, throwing all the chips on black or throwing all the chips on it's just PUFA or it's just plant foods. So it becomes, it's a little bit more complex. There's more nuance. There's the contextual perspective as well. That's important to understand, but this is more effective than just honing in on one element. Now you have a multi-pronged strategy to address these different areas to get an outcome. You have more tools in the toolkit to solve a problem than just the one hammer. <laughs> if you have right. screws and you have a hammer, you're screwed. You're going to be hammering screws into the wall. So we want to have different options available to be able to deal with these different particular circumstances. And I think that it, the dietary spheres, it's not arguing around which diet is the best anymore, right? I think that perspective is like, it's you're functioning in the same tier of argument. What needs to happen is people, we need to get to another tier of argument that's talking about multi-level strategy instead of singular strategy for one element. So, okay, let's combine strategies together 
and bring contextual elements into there. So we don't need to, it's not what we are thinking about. It's how we are thinking about things now in the dietary spheres that I think become essential to actually make a change. Got it. Okay. Let's um, shift gears a little bit to sex hormones and steroid hormones um, for a little bit. Sure. I, you, and, and talk about females to begin with, um, and then we can get into some of the other, I, I did have a question about sex hormone binding globulin I wanted to ask you, but there, I think when you get into the bioenergetic sphere, there is this, um, and I don't know, that's why I'm asking the question. There is this sure. sense that sort of like estrogen, bad, progesterone, good, you know, maximize the inverse, you know, uh, as much as possible. <laughs> um, yep. it, can you, can you discuss what, what you see in your experience of coaching people of, I'm, I'm sure there's more nuance in there, uh, but yeah. what is it that you see in general and, and some strategies for adjusting those for females? Yeah. So this is a great question. And this is part of the problems in the bioenergetic sphere is some of the black and white thinking around these things. So essentially there's a balance between estradiol and progesterone that, that we want to be shooting for. So the targets I'm shooting for is between a hundred to 500 times progesterone to estradiol and ratio. Now estradiol too low is problematic. You know, it, a lot of, for women who are not menopausal, estradiol is, is to some extent indicative of what's going on or serum estradiol of what's going on with ovarian, ovarian functioning. And that's why you see with women who have PCOS and some of these other issues that maybe the levels of estradiol are not right or wh whatever the different circumstances. So it's absolutely essential to have estradiol. The question is not that we want to just nuke it and have zero estradiol. That's the perspective that it gets promoted. But we want, again, we want to find there's an amount of estradiol that's important for actually producing, you know, or having a menstrual cycle and also being able to get pregnant and whatnot. When Ray discussed estradiol, he called it the hormone of new beginnings. And so what it's involved with, it's involved with growing tissues, not necessarily differentiating them, but growing tissues. And so that involves, that's involved with growing a child that's involved with growing the endometrial lining. And so it sets the stage for this growth. Also, if you have an injury at the local site of injury, you can have an increase of estradiol or in, in states of uh, stress or in states of, of uh, damage or injury, you can have increased estradiol because the estradiol is involved in, in signaling the growth of new tissue. But the problem is, is excessive growth of new tissue under the action of estradiol is highly problematic because you have basically unchecked growth on uh, the tissues are not differentiating. You're having, you're not getting the tissue, the cell to become specialized in whatever purpose it's going to. You're just getting a mass of tissue growing. And that's where progesterone comes in. Progesterone's job is to direct that growth. So it starts to differentiate tissues. It, it starts to stabilize the growth process and stabilize the tissue. So you want growth and differentiation, not just unchecked growth unchecked growth would be akin towards cancer. And so in the current spheres, in the mainstream perspective that generally gets promoted, there's this, the idea that estradiol is the female hormone. And Dr. Pete's work was basically like, like hang, it's not the female hormone. Females have estradiol, but estradiol is involved as this, it's almost to some extent, it's a growth promoting hormone. And it's, it can be involved in stress and it can be involved in dysfunction. So it's not that you want to have zero. It's that you want to have an amount that's appropriate for the specific task at hand. And you also want it to have be balanced by these other factors, including progesterone. And so that that's the perspective. We want to have a balance. We want to have the appropriate amounts of these things. And we don't want to be getting an excess of, of estradiol. And in today's environment, it's much less common to have an excess of progesterone. <laughs> It, in considering all the factors that are at hand and the way people are living and the things that we're exposed to, whether that's xenoestrogens, microplastics, whatever the component is, poor dietary choices, all of these stress itself, all of these elements are increasing estradiol at the expense of progesterone and, and breaking through that balance. And as we talked about, the unchecked growth becomes highly problematic. So with the with female hormones, I'm looking to balance things in. And even with men, if a man's uh, estradiol gets too low, he will not feel good. 
if a, if the progesterone, if the, excuse me, if the estradiol is too high, there will also be problems. So there's a target range that we're shooting for. We usually shoot about 20 to 30 picograms per milliliter of estradiol target range we're shooting for, for optimal function and anything below or above starts to become, uh, starts to become problematic for different reasons. So 20 to 30 being the range for men is men. what you, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then I can't give a specific for women because it depends on the cycle and the, all this stuff. There's a lot of different things, you know, cause the, the life cycle, what point they're at, are they, are they pregnant? The different points of the menstrual cycle, the uh, values will adjust. Right. Gotcha. Um, let, so, okay. So now it's probably a good point to talk about sex hormone binding globulin, which usually, uh, as I understand it is, um, uh, more of an issue for men um, because of its preference for binding testosterone and DHT. And uh, this, uh, it's when, when someone starts exploring this, looks like that might be the, you know, if say total testosterone and total DHT is in a good place, it's in a good range, but the free amounts are mid or low, then the point that the linchpin seems to be SHBG. Um, I just would like to get your take on that way of looking at it. And if it, that is the case, what are some of the causative factors for that elevated SHBG and some of their strategies for going about reducing it? Yeah. So another great question here. And what I want to talk about first though, is that women also have problems with SHBG. Uh, especially women who go on birth control and also women who uh, go on low carb or low calorie diets. And I have a lot of women I work with where their SHBG is over the reference range, like sky high men too, men, men, men as well. But basically with the change into the low carbohydrate, low calorie diets, you have a whole shift in the system basically, or, or okay, let me take one step back. My perspective on this and my contextualizing of this and like the way I'm viewing this, when you go into these low calorie, low carb diets and whatnot, you are signaling to some extent this, this famine S state, you don't have the carbs coming in. So you're, you're signaling to the body that, you know, it's winter, I guess is a very easy way to, to kind of textualize it. Yes. It lacks nuance, but just for argumentation's sake here. And so what winds up happening is there's a whole bunch of hormonal changes that occur around that to match the energy substrate, what energy is coming in, what sources do we have? And the reason why is, and this is why Dr. Pete's work in the bioenergetic perspective and understanding metabolism is so great. It's so amazing is that you have this, you start to get this lens to understand things. And that is the lens of energy and understanding that every single cellular process, almost, almost every single cellular process is energy dependent. So you have one element that you can hone in on and seeing why, are, why is this dysfunction? Where is this dysfunction being pulled from in terms of energy dysfunction or, or changes in energetic substrate coming in? And you also see that the entire hormonal system is linked to energetic substrate. It's linked to how much carbohydrate you have coming in, how much calories you have coming in, how much protein, how much fat, et cetera. And so the system is adjusting up or down the dial on all of these systems there's other factors that can affect, but primarily in this, this context of these low carb, low calorie intermittent fasting diets as what is the energetic substrate that's coming in. So when you don't have an adequate carbohydrate coming in, you start to lower insulin signaling, start to lower thyroid signaling, and you start to increase adrenal function and the stress hormones to start to liberate fuel sources from your tissues. And then you also start to lower reproductive function. And the reason we're lowering repro reproductive function to some extent in these states is because, you, again, you don't have substrate uh, that's optimal for the reproductive systems to work effectively. So a lot of people start to develop these hormonal aberrations. Now, it could just be like rank shutting down of ovarian function and, and gonadal function. That's one possibility. And that goes with thyroid, that goes with prolactin elevating and things like this. But then you also have the circumstance where the, the body shifts things in a different way, where you start to upregulate sex hormone binding globulin. And what that's doing is that's adjusting the effect of these sex steroids at their target cells. And so you're getting less of this effect in these stress states for a reason, because you're under stress, they're not going to optimize this process 
when you're under stress, your the stress state is a redistribution and reprioritization of nutrient and substrate utilization amongst different tissues, and less so a function of you know, or and less so a function of like um, let's just or it's it's doing that at the it's doing that in order to move the energy and whatnot to other tissues and not prioritize reproductive function while you're stressed out. It just wouldn't make sense to be you know, in this stress state and try to have a child, right? So the body starts to prioritize in general, where it's going to move its resources. And then it shuts down these other areas or furloughs them or puts them on, on backlog until the, the whole entire context changes. So the sex hormone binding globulin, what it does, as you, as you mentioned correctly, Jonathan, is it actually binds up the sex steroids and doesn't allow them to interact at the target tissue. Now, in the bioenergetic sphere, there was some talk by Dr. Pete that maybe sex hormone binding can go binding globulin can go into the cell. But for me, I perhaps differ a little bit on that perspective, or not that it doesn't go into the cell, but when I have people who have really high sex hormone binding globulin, and when and it's usually caused by all these other factors. So you could say these other factors are also involved, like low carbohydrate dieting or low calorie dieting or excessive exercise. They, they wind up having issues with their hormonal function, even though the levels of the absolute hormones are fine. And I think sex, sex hormone binding globulin is actually an important piece with this because you're not, at the end of the day, you have stuff floating in your serum, your blood, but what may, what has the effect of these hormones is when they reach the cell. So they need to reach the cell and the cell needs to respond to these signaling molecules. And if that doesn't occur, regardless of what your serum values are, you may, you're not going to have the effect. And sex hormone binding globulin is one of the factors that modulates this target effect at the cell. And a lot of times, just like I have people who are like, I can never get my sex hormone binding globulin down. And all I do is adjust their diet, make sure they're eating enough calories and they have their carbohydrates dialed in, they don't have digestive issues. And people who have had sex hormone binding globulin over the reference range for decades comes back into range and starts to trend down because the energetic problem was solved. They didn't need to take boron or these other different supplements to solve it. They needed to correct this major piece of energetic substrate coming into the system. Gotcha. Um, makes a lot of sense. And and uh, I think I was reading when I was going down this, this uh, pathway about fructose having a positive impact on, on lowering SHBG. Is that correct? So I think the sugars like sucrose in general will start to, the simple sugars will start to actually help to lower SHBG. Um, and I think part of that is through, again, like you're signaling at this, this abundant energetic substrate and you're also signaling insulin and, and you're changing that whole, you're switching the whole system out of this, uh, famine mode or lack of energy supply to now saying, Hey, it's summer. We have energy supply. We can actually adjust uh, the hormonal profile and shift things in the appropriate direction. Cause these are some of the, like light is another important signal, not necessarily for SHBG, but for the hormonal systems. So like you have these very, these very potent indicators to the body that there's adequate substrate available, that the environment is changing in a beneficial way. Cause I think a lot of people don't put into context that the body is constantly sensing its, its experience in the environment and then trying to adapt to the environment the best way possible to actually move forward. And so if you understand things in that context and you say, oh, when there's more sunlight and there's, there's more sugars coming in, that is an indication to the body that the environment is shifting in a better direction so we can start to support reproduction, reproductive function. We can start to support higher metabolic rates because we have ample metabolic substrate coming in. But when we create these famine-like circumstances, then obviously we're going to start to downregulate functions because we cannot support these functions without adequate metabolic substrate and components coming into the system. Um, and the, the, the change of the hormonal profile reflects these elements. Okay. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's close it there. We've, um, okay. we've covered a lot of ground and gosh, I do have more questions, but you know, we've been at it for over an hour. So Mike, um, let us know where people can find you and, uh, some of your offers. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate the opportunity to share them. So people can find me on my website, mikefave.com. And in terms of create, or in terms of wanting to create their own diet or structure 
their diet appropriately, calories, protein, carbs, fat. I do have a free guide and video series on my website called the Nutrition Blueprint, and you can pick that up at mikebabe.com. I'm hosting these retreats.